It's the Defenders Rewrite Part 1. And before we get started, I feel like I should probably acknowledge the fact that, yes, the team composition of the Defenders as they exist in the Marvel Netflix show, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, and Iron Fist is probably closer to something called the Marvel Knights, which is a team of street-level characters in the comics, as opposed to the Defenders, which in the comics started out as, like, Doctor Strange and the Silver Surfer and the Hulk. But, like, in reality, then we'd have to call them the Marvel Knights, which then you have to explain what the word Marvel means in context. Or they just have to call themselves the Knights, which doesn't really make sense. So, honestly, I think Defenders is a better name. Uh, okay. So let's start with some acknowledgements. Number one, after I put out my Why Marvel's Defenders Did Not Work video, I got more than a few comments from people who liked the Defenders. And to those people I say, cool, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, like what you like. I would still hope you give my series a shot. In fact, I'm especially interested to see how my rewrite holds up with people who liked the original series. Number two, and most importantly, like the most important thing I can say before we get going, even though I am rewriting their series, I do not think I am a better writer than any of the people who worked on the original Defenders. They are an incredibly talented and accomplished group of writers. Douglas Petrie wrote for shows like Buffy and Daredevil and The Batman, a show that I don't think gets nearly as much attention as it deserves. It was a really fun little Batman show. Marco Ramirez also wrote for Daredevil, as well as Sons of Anarchy and Orange is the New Black, two shows that to be honest, I have not seen, but I've heard very good things about, and I'm really excited for all you guys to tell me how much I should watch Sons of Anarchy in the comments. And then there's the head of Marvel Television, Joseph Loeb. He sometimes gets criticized for the Marvel TV's failures, but Loeb deserves so much credit. Under his leadership, Marvel TV created Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Agent Carter, The Runaways, Cloak and Dagger, Legion, Earth's Mightiest Heroes, and obviously, all of Marvel Netflix. And that's just as a producer. Loeb is also an accomplished screenwriter. He wrote the screenplay for Teen Wolf and Commando, which means he wrote this line. Remember, Sally, when I promised to kill you last? That's what made you, you did. I lied. That's Loeb. He's also written many excellent comics, including Age of Apocalypse, Batman Hush, the Superman Batman series, Fallen Sun, A Man for All Seasons, and one of the greatest and most influential Batman stories of all time, one of my favorite comics, The Long Halloween. Loeb also wrote the Marvel Color series. If you haven't heard of it, it's a set of reimaginings of origins for classic Marvel characters that includes Daredevil Yellow, a terrific read. If you've never read any Daredevil comics, I recommend giving it a look. Also, I met Loeb once, he's a really nice guy. So Loeb gets it. Petrie and Ramirez get it. They are better writers than I am. On top of that, I have not only the benefit of hindsight, which is huge, but no time constraints, no studio directives to deal with. Like uh, Marvel TV wanted to get rid of the hand in this series, but like I don't, so I'm not gonna. Certain scheduling difficulties might make what I'm trying to do impossible. Some of the effects may be too expensive. And most importantly, the characters I want to use that are not in the original Defenders series may be unavailable. Like maybe Marvel Studios has plans for them. Maybe they don't have plans, but they want to keep their options open in the future. Either way, it's totally possible that the version of the Defenders may have been impossible to create for a million different reasons. This is just a fun exercise. All of that being said, let's get to the rewrite. So to begin, I want to talk about episode titles. Sometimes the Marvel Netflix shows do cool things with episode titles, like every episode of Jessica Jones starts with AKA since her original comic was called Alias. In the first season of Luke Cage, every episode was named after a Gangstar song. Second season did the same thing, but with Pete Rock and CL Smooth. The first season of Iron Fist, the titles are all Shaolin Kung Fu sequences. And then the second season, all the episode titles are the names of different Iron Fist comics. And all eight episodes of my Defenders rewrite would follow a similar convention. Now, I don't know if this is even possible. Like, the rights might not work. Maybe. I have no idea. But in a perfect world, every episode of The Defenders would share a title with a song by one of the quintessential New York hip-hop groups, Run DMC. Couple reasons why. 
First, like I said, Run DMC is one of the classic New York hip hop groups. Like they're from Hollis, Queens. Everybody knows that about them. Second, they're a group of people like the Defenders. Third, one of the things that Run DMC is most known for is blending the 80s hip hop style with rock and roll to form a new kind of sound. That's what our Defenders would be doing, like blending different styles and personalities together to form something new. And fourth, one of the members of Run DMC, the DMC part, Daryl McDaniels, is a huge comic fan. He loves Marvel Comics. Like in an interview with Fuse, McDaniels says that growing up a mild-mannered Catholic school kid, all I did was go to school and read comic books. I was strictly a Marvel comic said. The Avengers, Iron Man, Captain America, The Hulk, Iron Fist, you name it, I loved Marvel because it was the city. It was all New York. The same backdrop I was living in, this universe was in the Marvel universe. Comics did for me what hip hop did for me. As I got older, it empowered me, it inspired and educated me. I learned about Nazis and space exploration, everything from comics. The dude loves comics. I also bumped into him at the show floor for New York Comic Con a while back. He was just walking around, super nice guy. So here are my episode titles. They all relate in some way to the episodes themselves. In this video, we're gonna focus on episodes one and two. And the first four episodes are each going to focus on a different defender. And we're gonna start with Daredevil because he's the most popular. Now, that does not mean that the other defenders won't appear in those episodes, but for a reason that'll become clear later, each episode is organized around a specific and different defender. Also. This series is going to loosely follow the three-act structure. I talked about it a lot in my Justice League rewrite, but it's just a helpful way to organize a story, like keep it moving. And it's a structure people are familiar with, regardless of whether they realize it or not. So episodes one and two are act one, and they serve two different purposes. Episode one is going to introduce the ordinary world, which is crucial in this series since this is a team up and like even more so than with the Avengers, there is a very good chance that most Defenders viewers have not seen every series leading up to the Defenders. Like you probably have people in there who saw a season of Daredevil and maybe watched season one of Jessica Jones and maybe started season one of Luke Cage but didn't finish it and didn't even check out any of Iron Fist. Like we need to make sure that everyone is brought up to speed before this starts. So Raising Hell is going to start with Matt. He is tracking the hand, trying to get them out of the city. It makes sense, since Nobu died at the end of season two, to introduce a new mini boss for this episode. And I did some quick Googling and found someone named Matsuo. He's, listen, he's a character from the comics who's part of the hand, that's all. We're not going to deal with him in the future. He's just the last member of the hand in New York after Nobu's death. And Matt has given up on being Matt Murdock. Electra's death has driven out the last of his humanity. He's out for revenge. He wants to destroy the hand. There is only the devil left. So Matt fights some ninjas. Eventually, he finds Matsuo and takes on Matsuo and the rest of his hand ninjas by himself. And like, I mean, Matt's good, but he's not that good. So he gets overpowered, and right as all seems lost, who should appear but Danny, Rand, and Colleen Way. Danny and Colleen also end their first season with the goal of defeating the Hand. So they would logically end up at the same place as Matt. They both have costumes on, so they're able to protect their identity, especially since, and not to nitpick, not unlike my podcast, mostly nitpicking, subscribe. Danny Rand is still like a guy, like Danny Rand is still a public figure. So why wouldn't he try to keep his identity a secret? And then if he's going to do that, it makes enough sense that Colleen would do the same thing. So they both have costumes. Danny is in like a green tracksuit, maybe with the classic yellow Iron Fist mask, because why not? It makes it easy to hide a stuntman and it just looks cool. And then Colleen is wearing her white tracksuit with a white mask. And they both immediately recognize that Matt is on their side. So the three of them team up and defeat the ninjas. Matt fights Matsuo, and Matsuo can either just like disappear or take a cyanide capsule, but not before telling the three that the hand will leave the city now, but this isn't the last they've seen of them. 
So that's the end of the hand in season one of The Defenders. That's not to say that like we'll never see them again in any of the Marvel Netflix shows. I think there's a hand-centric storyline that would really work for Defenders called Shadowland. It's a Daredevil comic story from a while back where Matt takes over the hand and uses them as his own personal army to keep order in the city. Eventually he ends up losing it and the rest of the defenders need to stop him. It's kind of like a more one-sided civil war just in terms of morality. Problem is, that kind of story only really works if the heroes have a relationship. Like, it's way more interesting if they are forced to stop their one-time teammate as opposed to just some guy they haven't really met. So that can all be saved for season two of Defenders. Save the hand, save Elektra. She'd be a great teammate for Matt, but leave them out of season one. So then Matt and Danny and Colleen will all talk. Danny wants to team up with Matt, fight crime in the city since they both have similar skill sets and were trained by ninjas, but Matt works alone. The death of Elektra has really like messed him up. So he's on his own. And this is where Danny explains what he and Colleen have been up to in season one of Iron Fist to kind of give himself a little credit. And Matt comes back explaining how much he's been through and how he doesn't need Danny's help. So we understand where Daredevil season two ended. Then Matt leaves. Colleen and Danny talk to themselves. Danny says, well, he's right. Matsuo was our last lead. Like, what do we do now? Colleen says, well, we need to wait until they make their next move. Well, then what do we do until then? Colleen says, you've spent the last eight years training to be the Iron Fist, but I think it's time you figured out how to be Danny Rand. So that's Danny's arc. Danny Rand has always had a simple goal, destroy the hand. And he has defeated the hand, at least for now. So then what does Danny do? Over the course of this season, Danny is going to figure that out. Next, we check in on Luke Cage. He's in prison. In case you don't remember, season one of Luke Cage ends with Luke getting taken back to prison for escaping back when he was Carl Lucas. I know, it's been a while. We'll meet Luke when he's serving his sentence. And Luke has a court date. He's taken into the courtroom and who is sitting at his table but Jaron Hogarth. He asks who she is. She says that she's his lawyer. Luke says, uh, I already have a lawyer. And Hogarth says that, uh, that guy wasn't really gonna be able to help you. Luke says, I don't think I can afford you. And Hogarth says, yeah, you're right, but you're lucky you have a friend who I owe a favor. Luke turns around in the stands, he sees Jessica Jones. Hogarth reads the court the riot act, like explains that she'll sue the Justice Department for what happened to Luke during his first prison stay and bring all kinds of national attention to the prison. The judge immediately dismisses the case. Luke is a free man. Luke and Jessica meet in the courtroom. He thanks her. She said, it's all right. Hogarth owes her a million favors. And Luke and Jessica ride back to Pops' barbershop where Claire has thrown Luke a party. Everyone from the Luke Cage supporting cast is there. You got Bobby Fish, Misty Knight, Dave Griffith. And they sit down, have some drinks, and talk. This is where we get an explanation of what happened in Luke Cage Season 1 and Jessica Jones Season 1. They're both sharing stories. Now, the entire audience is up to speed. After a while, everybody leaves the party. Claire has a shift at the hospital. Jessica has a desk full of cases. The only person left is Bobby Fish. Luke and Bobby talk about Pops and how crazy everything has become. And then Bobby says, I've got to go. You got a train to catch. Luke says, where are you going this late? Home. Luke is confused. You live right up the block. Then Bobby explains the big change. Not anymore. I got evicted last month. Evicted? Yeah, buildings being torn down. Half of Harlem is. Got bought up by that new developer, Alexandra Bont. Who? Head of Bont Construction. Everybody just calls her Alexandra. She's the new kingpin, just like without all the crime. After guys like Fisk, Owlsley, Stokes, and Meacham got taken out of the picture, she swooped in and took over New York City real estate. She's developing all over Harlem, rent control departments, low income housing, all gone turning it into skyscrapers and factories and all kinds of stuff. Harlem is all shaken up. Is there anything we can do? We all knew this was coming eventually. You can't fight change. And this is Luke's arc through the series. He's Harlem's hero, but he's up against a problem that he might not be able to solve. Like Luke needs to figure out what being a symbol means. 
And that's Raising Hell, episode one. We've set up the ordinary world and introduced the new problem. It doesn't seem like a Defenders level problem yet, but Alexandra is gonna set the rest of the plot in motion. Episode two, Hard Times. So this is the second part of act one, the part where our heroes explore the problem, then they're forced to act. And Hard Times is the Luke Cage centric episode. It's mainly Luke dealing with the effect Alexandra has been having on the neighborhood, trying to figure out what, if anything, he can do. One of the running themes of Marvel Netflix, although one that doesn't really come up, specifically in phase one, was class and inequality. All the best villains were well off, like Fisk, Kilgrave, Cottonmouth, even Meacham. And the best heroes weren't necessarily like poor, but they weren't doing very well. So they frequently had to take power back from the rich and powerful figures who were in control of the city. We're gonna see that here, except in this case, the rich character isn't like a supervillain, she isn't in control of a mob or an army of ninjas. Alexandra is just a businesswoman. And that makes her even more dangerous since our heroes can't solve this problem the normal way. This isn't your typical superhero problem. So Luke's in Harlem and he's noticing a pretty strong increase in street level crime. Muggings, carjackings, drug sales. And as Luke intervenes, he notices that a lot of the criminals are just local kids, not the usual criminals Luke was dealing with before. Luke asks around and learns that a lot of the people who are evicted have turned to crime as a way to make ends meet, so they can just like still afford to live in the city. And Luke starts seeing the effects of the overdevelopment firsthand. And this is going to be true for all of our heroes. Matt, as Daredevil, is fighting more street level crime than usual. Jessica is also seeing a flurry of new cases. Same ones as usual. Oh, my husband is disappearing at night and I think he might be cheating on me. Someone's in a custody battle and they want Jessica to surveil their spouse. But these people can't pay. They don't have the money because of the disruption in the city. And this forces Jessica to consider her place in the universe. After the events of season one, Jessica has a reputation now as someone who helps people, but that isn't how she sees herself. As far as she's concerned, Jessica Jones is just a stronger than average private investigator. And that's her arc in this season. Jessica needs to decide if her powers come with a responsibility to help people. So then we get a look at Danny Rand. He checks in with his friend Ward. Danny wants to see what good he can do as Danny Rand, so he asks Ward if he can get involved with the company. Now, Ward is happy to have Danny back in his life, because Ward's father is dead and Joy has been very distant recently. So Ward gives Danny a shot. Rand is working on some projects that Danny can help with. This makes Danny happy, and he's a little confused, but like maybe there is a place for him in the world. Back to Luke. Luke talks to DW, asks him how bad things are. DW tells Luke that things in Harlem are serious. Like Luke doesn't know what he can do to help, but he wants to do something, and DW suggests going to a protest. People have been pretty active recently, protesting Bond construction sites and companies working with Bond. In fact, there's a protest later today. Luke should go down and show the people of Harlem that he's on their side. Luke thinks this is a great idea. So Luke goes to the protest a ton of people outside of Bont HQ. And not surprisingly, who is leading the protest but Mariah. She's on a megaphone, on a box in front of everyone, talking about how the neighborhood is losing what made it special and they need to make investments to keep Harlem Harlem. Her usual thing. The crowd is eating it up. And she sees Luke Cage and singles him out that he's coming to support the protest. They have a little talk close that nobody can hear. Carl, back so soon. Yeah, I'm here to support the neighborhood. I'm wondering what you're getting out of this, Mariah. Oh, Carl, I'm here for Harlem. These developments threaten all of Harlem. I hope we can put our differences beside us for now so that we can show these people that we're united in this. Luke is a little hesitant, but it does make sense. Mariah does seem to genuinely care about the neighborhood, and this does seem to pose an existential threat to Harlem. So Luke agrees, just this once. Mariah takes Luke onto the platform. It's Luke Cage, Harlem's hero, here to support the protests against these developers who are destroying our city. 
Luke waves at the protesters, they cheer, it's going well, but then one of the protesters shouts at Luke, what are you gonna do? And Luke is caught confused. Well, I don't know what you mean. You're like, how are you gonna support us? What are you going to do? I'm, I'm here. I'm gonna look out for the community. Mariah steps in. Luke Cage is going to protect this city. And then someone shouts, the Wrecker is protecting the city. He's doing something. Mariah says, the Wrecker is a vigilante. He does not represent this neighborhood. Luke asks Mariah, well, who's the Wrecker? Mariah says, oh, you haven't heard? He's a vandal, like he goes to construction sites at night, tags them up, cuts tires, breaks equipment, like small things. Someone shouts, he is sending a message. Mariah gets back control of the crowd. No, we are sending a message. A message that Harlem will not stand for this. And we do not need to break the law to do that. But we're so tired of waiting. And then the crowd starts turning on Mariah and Luke. But before things get bad, a car pulls up. Mariah uses this to draw focus. Oh, uh, here they are. The people that are going to work with Alexandra to destroy this city. Let's show them how Harlem feels about what they are doing. And who walks out of the car but Ward and Danny. That's right, Rand is the company that's working with Alexandra. They walk through the protests and people are screaming. Danny asks Ward if this is normal and Ward explains what's going on. Danny is a little concerned. Also, this will be the first time that Luke and Danny get a good look at each other. Then we follow Danny into the meeting and it goes exactly how you'd expect because Danny is still super naive. Everything is going how Ward and Alexandra want. Danny disrupts the proceedings by talking about the protests and like Ward tries to rein Danny in because he knows what's happening, but Danny won't play ball. Now Alexandra threatens Danny that this isn't going to change anything like another company will pay for the building. And Danny says, well, it won't be my name on that building and storms out. Ward and Danny argue. Now, Danny is having doubts that he can do any good as Danny Rand. Maybe he is only useful as the Iron Fist. Now for the last scene of the episode, we go back to Luke. He's walking the streets of Harlem at night, trying to figure out what he can do. And then Luke sees a lightning strike at a nearby construction site, which is weird because it isn't even really cloudy. Luke hears someone scream. So then Luke goes to help. Now. The camera is not going to move. We are going to stay where Luke started. See him run into the distance, have what looks like a short conversation that ends in a little bit of shouting. Some people turn on their lights and come outside. And then we see Luke come flying back towards the camera. He lands in the street like a meteor. The concrete around him is destroyed. Luke is out cold. Cut to black, end of episode two. So a couple big differences. First of all, Alexandra. So she's not in charge of the hand anymore. She's just a businesswoman. Now, Alexander Bond was a character in Daredevil comics. He was introduced and kind of retconned as the original Kingpin, although that's not really what Alexandra is here. She's just another very, very dangerous developer who threatens the city, but only as a developer. So we're still gonna have Sigourney Weaver here, but she's not gonna be the main villain of the season. She's just gonna get the ball rolling. We've also been introduced to a character called The Wrecker. What's his deal? We haven't seen him, we've heard about him. He's clearly up to something, but he's not like The Wrecker we know from the comics. So like, what's his deal? We'll find out in part two of the Defenders rewrite. Oh, and one more thing. If you, like myself, are a writer, or a video creator, or just a person who does things, you probably recognize that one of the most difficult parts of actually finishing a project is organization. I found that it's what separates the good creators from the really great creators. Just keeping track of your tasks, taking effective notes, it's hard. And if you want to get a better handle on your own productivity, I would highly recommend checking out fellow YouTuber Thomas Frank's class called Productivity Masterclass. Thomas goes through the different systems he uses to take notes and organize tasks, how he completes those during the day, and how you can apply those systems to your own projects to make them more efficient and just get things done. 
And you can find Productivity Masterclass and more than 25,000 others at this video sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with classes in productivity, design, writing, video editing, and so much more. Premium membership gives you unlimited access so that you can improve your skills and get things done. And if you want to join the millions of students already learning on Skillshare today, you can get two months of Skillshare for free if you click on the link in this video description. Sign up and start learning today with Skillshare. So thank you so much to everyone for continuing to support the channel on Patreon. You guys are the best. You want to see your name up here, get access to videos early, other cool stuff, throw in literally any amount of money at patreon.com slash nandoviewmovies. You have no idea how much I appreciate it. Also, subscribe to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking, where every week me and my co-host DJ pick apart a piece of pop culture by looking exclusively at the details. We're almost done with our Dance to Joker series, where we've been reviewing a lot of the old Joker media to get ready for the new movie that comes out soon. So stuff like the Batman 66 movie, um, the Batman Beyond movie, the Arkham games, Suicide Squad, stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. We are at Nitpicking Pod on Twitter, and you can find us wherever you listen to podcasts. And finally, follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash nandoviewmovies. It's where I post updates about videos and podcasts, and where I post my thoughts on preposterous articles that put the different Iron Fist characters into Hogwarts houses, and Misty Knight is in Ravenclaw, but Danny Rand is in Gryffindor, when realistically, Danny Rand is not even, he's kind of like a Hufflepuff, I guess, and Misty Knight is way more of a Gryffindor than Danny Rand. That's just my opinion. That's up to interpretation from you guys. Oh, and follow me on Twitter because I'm going to New York Comic Con this year, and if you are also there, I'll probably let you guys know where to come say hi. So that's twitter.com slash nandoviewmovies. That's all I got. I'll see you next time.